May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I'm not a gardener. My grandfather was. My mom is. I didn't really inherit the green thumb gene. So those of you who know this process a little better than me will have to indulge the reflections of an inexperienced gardener, to say the least. But for some of you, this will be quite familiar. Late March, early April rolls around, and the buds of your hybrid tea roses have started to break. So for you discipline types, you know that that means it's pruning time. So you put on a long sleeve shirt, you grab some gloves, rub a little sunscreen on your face, maybe grab a hat, lather up in bug spray, take your pruning shears, and get to it. You start by removing dead or diseased canes, clearing up the center of the plant. You don't want anything going on in the middle, no overlap. You even cut back some good canes so that you can shape the framework. And the process is simple enough. The reason you prune roses is for them to be at their healthiest and most beautiful. The idea is that certain things, even good things, have to be cleaned, cut back, chopped off in order for the roses to be what they can really be. Jesus' teaching this morning in the scripture that we'll consider for a little bit requires us to practice our spiritual gardening chops, as it were. The plant we're trying to cultivate is sexual desire, a part of God's good creation. And we have no reason to question that, but dangerous if left unmanaged. And so just like last week, Jesus goes beyond just what to do because something as complicated and as serious as this can't be addressed with a few checklist items that we need to make sure we do. He's going to teach us to be a certain kind of person. But becoming that kind of person, engaging in that kind of spiritual formation will involve some sacrifices. Because like roses for our desire, and really our life as disciples all together, to be at its healthiest and its most beautiful, some pruning is required. So our text this morning is Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 27, and we'll read through verse 30. Jesus says this, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right hand causes you to sin, tear it out, and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. This is the word of the Lord. What we need to say at the outset, because quite frankly, this text has been abused and used to say just this, there is no reason to think either in this text or in the Bible itself that sexual desire is inherently sinful, that in and of itself there's something wrong with it. Otherwise, you folks in here with children, which is a great many of you, got some explaining to do. No, the Bible reveals to us from the very first two chapters that sex and sexual desire are a part of God's good creation, the creation that he looks upon and like a master craftsman sits back and thinks, this is great. In Genesis 1 and 2, God gives humanity the gift of sex, that they can be fruitful and multiply, participate as his image bearers in his work of creation. And what we see as we read passages like Song of Songs chapter 7, I realize for some of you, you're thinking, gosh, it's been a while since I've blown the dust off that book of the Bible. But Song of Psalms chapter 7 reveals that sex is not just some instinctual reproductive act for us like it is some kinds of animals, but that actually God has made it to be enjoyable and desirable, drawing husbands and wives together into deeper love and intimacy with each other. This is God's gift to us, and we need not see it as otherwise. So Jesus is not prohibiting that, nor was Moses before him. What they prohibit together is sex with, well, someone else's spouse. God has created sex to be enjoyed in one man, one woman marriage. 
So that when the seventh commandment, which is what Jesus is quoting here, says you shall not commit adultery, it is referring specifically not to the act itself, but to sleeping with another man's wife, thus defiling not only your own marriage covenant, but somebody else's in the process. As with murder, though, Jesus sees the visible and punishable act forbidden by the commandment, which last week was murder and in this case is adultery, as what R.T. France calls the outward expression of an inward desire. Such behavior didn't come out of nowhere. He says everyone who even looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery in his heart. And of course, this teaching applies to women too. In Jesus' time, it was more urgent, perhaps, to say it to men who could get away with most anything. But in our time, it's important that we make these kinds of statements gender inclusive. And the phrase that the ESV translates, looks with lustful intent, refers not just some kind of passing glance. I don't think it really even refers to thinking someone is good looking. Otherwise, once again, us married folks are in trouble. No, it's referring to something of an imaginative glance. The kind of glance where you look upon a person and, to put it bluntly, wish you could have sex with them. Maybe even begin concocting a plan to do so. Or, if nothing else, in the privacy of your own home, you imagine having sex with that person. And Jesus teaches that those kinds of glances are, in fact, just as destructive as the act of adultery itself going beyond just the criminality of some kind of act and causing our very hearts, the epicenter of your and my identity, to be adulterous and tempting us to take destructive action to satisfy our selfish desires. And frankly, his teaching has biblical precedent. See, once upon a time, there was a king who decided to stay cozied up at home during the time when kings go out to battle. And so one spring afternoon, while the king's men were out fighting his battles for him, the king decided to get up from his couch and enjoy a walk along the palace rooftop. As he walked, he enjoyed the cool spring breeze and scanned the horizon. And to his surprise, he saw a beautiful woman down a couple of blocks bathing on her rooftop. What's a quick look? The king thought to himself, his marriage wasn't in the best shape. He had married his predecessor's daughter, and while their time as newlyweds was filled with passion and romance, recently they'd come to hold one another in contempt, which doesn't exactly make for a happy household. So the king needed some relief, and this woman was providing that and then some. What the heck, he thinks to himself, so he sends one of his guys who find out if she's single. Well, come to find out she's married, and not only is she married, she's married to one of the king's soldiers, one of the guys who's out fighting that battle that the king was supposed to be leading. You would think that this is the part where the king quenches this, moves on, no, no, not go to infringe on somebody else's household. But to the contrary, the king's desires were too strong, and he saw this as an opportunity. Her husband was away. Perfect he thinks. So he sends messengers to her who then take her to him, who can say no to a king after all. And getting her in his quarters, he indulges his desires and he lays with her, sending her on her way the next morning. One night of passion, no complications, no hurt feelings, nobody really even has to know. That is, until a few weeks later, when the woman sent word to the king that she was pregnant and there wasn't a doubt in the world who the father was. Most of you are familiar with this story. It's the story of King David taking advantage of Bathsheba, which quite frankly is putting the act very lightly. And you know how the story ends. What started as one quick glance ended in the destruction of Bathsheba's family, the murder of her husband, and the death of her firstborn child. All that from a glance. You and I aren't so different. With our lustful gaze, we objectify anybody and everybody as we please. Our neighbors of the opposite sex, whether they know it or not, exist purely for my gratification. 
Frankly, our sexual desires become a metric of value. In other words, if I think you're hot, I think you're important. And if I think you're not, well, let the hearer understand. Sure, we try to comfort ourselves. I've never violated someone physically. Come on, you're being a little bit unfair. But if those folks who we spent time glancing at could just glimpse behind the curtain of our lustful gazes, they'd notice just how violated they were. Maybe not in person, but in our minds. Yeah, there's no rule to do anything about this. No thou shalt not that can cleanse the human heart. If we hope to fulfill that command, you shall not commit adultery, which is what this section is about, fulfilling the law in Christ. It is our hearts, not just our petty exterior actions, that have to be formed, ridded of all the things that cause us to stumble, and just like last week, Jesus' word for us this morning is that that formation is available to us. It's at hand. We can cease being adulterous in heart and become, as he blesses in the Beatitudes, pure in heart, able to see God and live according to his purposes. And a crucial part of that formation, a crucial part of blooming into that kind of disciple, is pruning back all the junk that's preventing our growth. So we begin, the gardeners that we are, by tearing away what's harmful to us. Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, or some of your translations say, stumble, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. That expression causes you to sin, or for some, causes to stumble, in the Greek is scandalazo, where we get the word scandalous, scandalize. And it's serious. It doesn't denote some kind of petty misdeed. It denotes a complete straying from the path of God's will and salvation itself. It's a grave offense, one so serious that if left unchecked, risks eternal separation from God. Serious threats, therefore, require serious responses. And Jesus' proposed response is as shocking as it is graphic. Tear out your eyes and cut off your hands if they cause you to stumble. Now, of course, Jesus is exaggerating. Self-mutilation was a common metaphor to indicate the seriousness of an action. So there's no reason to leave here thinking, shucks, preacher said I'm supposed to cut my hand off. It's not exactly healthy preaching. No, he's exaggerating to make a point, which we often do. If wrongful sexual desire is this dangerous, Jesus' disciples are to say no when sexual desire strikes inappropriately. In other words, outside of the context of marriage, and we're to rid ourselves of the things that cause us to profane God's will and design for such things. And as many of you have tried to practice this, understand this will not come easy. It will involve immense sacrifice, especially in a culture like ours that promotes sex as one of the highest goods, where sex is the ultimate salesperson, and where my very identity is wrapped up in my sexual desire. So sometimes this will feel as though we've lost something valuable. We may have to cut off relationships that don't support our efforts at godly sexuality, or perhaps our bodies have developed a neurochemical attachment to our sexual indulgences such that we actually experience withdrawals as we allow God to prune our hearts. Such is the nature of sacrifice. It isn't a sacrifice if you didn't mind doing away with it in the first place, but we make that sacrifice. Trusting as Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, and that Jesus more than well indicates, that no sacrifice is too great if it enables us to conquer what cuts us off from Jesus. That applies to things well beyond the issue of sexual desire. That applies to anger last week. It will apply to oath-making here in a couple of weeks. It's actually a very important general principle. No sacrifice, no relationship, no circumstances, no technology, no nothing is too great if it enables us to conquer what cuts us off from Jesus. Well, it feels that way pruning roses too. The idea that we're losing something. The idea that, oh, this doesn't feel right. 
It feels destructive. Anyone who cares about plants dreads tearing off all of the leaves, which is a pretty shocking part of pruning. To get ready for this sermon, I looked up a few YouTube videos since before this. I had no idea what I was talking about. And one of the first things they did was pull off every single leaf. And just at face value, I think, well, that seems a little counterintuitive. And folks who do that cringe as they cut off not only the dead and decaying canes, but what seem to be perfectly healthy ones, cutting them off down to size. But a good gardener knows that these are the sacrifices required for the rose to grow, be its healthiest, most beautiful self. Such is the nature of Jesus' call to us. I don't want to spend too much time on the negative incentive. We can call it that. Better to lose one of your hands and have all your hands and go to hell. That message pretty much gives itself. No, the call to prune our hearts, a dire warning as it is, can't be lost in the bigger picture where Jesus is teaching us how to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world, the pure in heart who get to behold God, the righteous people of God, set apart as a city on the hill, revealing to the world not some kind of repressed way of life, not some kind of oppressed way of life, but a better, more holy, and if you actually give it a try, more human way of being. A human life where sexuality and sexual desire are at their healthiest, most beautiful form, where so-called casual sex doesn't leave me putting on my clothes the next day in guilt, confusion, and shame, but sex with our spouses that draws us closer together in the pinnacle of intimacy, making us fall more and more in love with each other as this covenant that we've made symbolizes God's loving faithfulness to us. A way of being human where my value is not defined by my sex appeal, and neither is yours. A way where love prevails and lust, the terrorizing emotion that it is, is put to death. And a way of being human that is available to you and to me right now. And what a beautiful life it is. I don't have to ask if you agree with me. I don't have to reach for an amen because I know you agree with me. In the depths of your heart, you know and I know that Jesus is right on this one, and we crave it. Ask yourselves then this morning, what's stopping you? What's standing in your way, causing you to stumble? What needs cutting off and tearing out? Not just the things you've always been meaning to cut off and tear out, but things that perhaps you don't want to let go of, a burden that you've grown used to carrying. What needs pruning from not just your works, but your very heart? the inner depths of your entire being. And what's stopping you?